Begin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, could you at the beginning give me give me some specification on the wind farm that's that that that, that is going to be built? This this uh, wind farm is the first wind farm of Serbia, as many of you know already, and it consists of three turbines. Each of it has 3.3 megawatt of installed power. So the total installed power is nearly 10 megawatt, let's say, just a little bit below 10 megawatt. It's, uh, according to European classification, it's a medium facility, whereas you have medium facilities up to 10 megawatt and then you go for larger facility. The facility is indeed connected with uh, the distribution network and that's why it's medium because it is intended to serve a local community. When the facility is big, it is connected to transformer uh, stations and then from there to transmission network and it is intended to serve the whole country or the whole district. Our facility in this way is a kind of small and uh, we are focused to serve the local district areas of Vojvodina. Um, okay, um, now we already uh, talked uh, uh, before we started uh, uh, filming this. Um, um, can, you, uh, can you tell me um, what is the investment level uh, in a matter of uh, how much money was invested and how much money was needed to start the, 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 the farm? Uh, investment is kind of uh, site-specific. I mean, generally the ingredients to make a wind farms are civil works and technology. Technology costs you the same, whereas you install it in uh, Serbia, US, Italy or another country. The uh, site-specific part, it's, uh, as I said before, depending on the soil, on the access road. One thing is if you build uh, on top of a mountain, one thing is if you build in Vojvodina. So, Roughly, this first investment we performed here is uh, in the range of 15 million euros. And so far, our commitment uh, for wind energy in Serbia has been confirmed for 25 million euros because we have a second facility under construction, which is located in Vreshets. So, we are parallelly building two facilities. The first one will be opened officially on the 12th of November, and uh, the other one will follow after the next summer. Uh, if weather allows, I mean. Can you give me some specifics on the on the other facility, like uh, how much energy will it produce? The other facility actually was born before in terms of project, but it took more time to build it. Actually, it took more time to get the building permits. Uh, it's a smaller facility than Kula. It consists of two machines, 3.3 megawatt each. Uh, we intended to build uh, this facility uh, as uh, our demo test for wind energy in Serbia. But then we had other projects in development and it happened that Kula came before, so we started before with Kula. Nevertheless, the principles are the same. Uh, medium facility connected to the local uh, grid and uh, functional and serving the local community of Reshets in our case. Now, um, was it easy um, if we talk about connection, uh, was it easy to get all the permissions and uh, all the papers you needed for the connection to the local uh, distributive network? Um, well, we have to divide the problem in two phases, let's say. One thing is to get the approval and the building permit in order to build the facility. And one other story is to get the connection right. The connection right indeed is a part of the building permit itself. Um, locally, we never had any problem with the, uh, with the Electro Vojvodina specifically. Uh, we are cooperating uh, with, uh, with, at a very high level with them and we are pretty much satisfied of their reaction, reaction times. Concerning the building permit is a little bit more complicated. Uh, Serbia was not ready to wind energy. It took a lot of time and a lot of activity to uh, adapt the current bureaucratic system to the, this new form of energy. Uh, many governments succeeded over time and they were, let's say, little steps ahead and little steps back. This had, uh, in a way, badly influenced the overall timing of the operation. It took us mm, over six, seven years to build the first one. We'll come to that. Just want one, one more question about this connection thing. Um, and it is, um, <coughs> did, 
did you build the um, now I, I have this uh, there a problem with the English expression about the transmission station did you build the transmission station and whom does it belong to now not in our case because our two facilities as I said before are connected to existing trafo stations that's why they are in medium voltage and that's why we are cooperating with the uh, Electro Voivodina. So basically we are sharing the existing infrastructure. There is no new infrastructure which has been built for connection. In case of larger wind farms, we will have to build a trafo station which is dedicated to the wind farm. In that case we have to reach an agreement with EMS and we have to build the facility which will be owned by EMS and will be managed and operated by EMS. So we act as a sole investors, whereas EMS will act as a final owner and beneficiary of the structure. So basically we build a new infrastructure and we donate that to the state-owned company EMS, which operates that for us and for the grid stability of the country itself. So basically building these medium facilities is much easier than building those big. It's a matter of strategy. It was our first investment in the country. Uh, we, we, we started the long journey with a step. We don't, we don't jump in the, in the dark. So we know and we capitalize the experience of building and tying it in into an existing facility. We do not have steel experience in building a trafo station with EMS, but we look forward to do it very soon because we're now defining our role and their role and we are very confident it's going to be possible. Okay, now you, you, you said yourself the project is existing for six or seven years. So what happened that today you are finally in the position to get this project and the idea to reality? Well, once you collect all the papers and you achieve all the necessary permits, you can finally file to the banks uh, your proposal and the banks will review it and then eventually decide to finance it or not. It took us a very long time, as I said before, to collect all the necessary papers. The banks which supported us in this first venture were Erste Bank from Austria and Unicredit from Serbia and they both uh, spent a limited time to review the papers and to say okay we like it. Actually we're not inventing nothing new, we're just bringing into Serbia something which Serbia still didn't have and we saw the opportunity. So, okay. um, but one would ask um, for these six or seven years, uh, the company is spending some money. Um, Much uh, money, I would say. Okay, uh, 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 I'll come to that. So the company is spending money and spending and spending and spending, waiting for a moment that everything, everything is at the position so you can start. But one would ask, where's the interest to wait for six or seven years to fulfill it and spend the money all the time? Very honestly and transparently speaking, if I had known before that it would have taken me eight years to build that facility, I wouldn't even start. So it's like a poker game here. I mean, we were pulled in slowly, okay? And then when you are in, you cannot leave because you will lose the game. So the winner takes his all. We stayed and we and we proven that this is possible. But this as well is anti-economic. Development time cannot last forever. So when it's going too long, the money we're spending to keep a facility here and to keep a, a structure with people, employees, engineers and everybody cost money and burns future dividends. So it will take us a lot of time and a lot of years to recover the money we upfronted before the construction of the facility. And this will badly influence our business plan like everybody else which is investing in wind energy in this country. Somewhere I've heard or somebody told me that investors would all have already spent some 35 million euros during these seven or eight years waiting for a moment. Does it sound real? Because it's really a lot, <laughs> spending a lot of money for doing it, nothing. Well, th there, there are many ways to make a marriage. You can do it with nothing or with uh, you know, the best party ever. I'm not going to judge about the others. I'm telling you what, what, what I see here because I put the money and Mr. Kostic, our partner, put the money as well. We saw that it's kind of reasonable to spend a significant part of the future value in the development phase. The bigger the project, the biggest is the money you have to upfront. If we're talking about investors which are 
developing projects of hundreds of megawatt, it's a kind of reasonable that they may have spent so far around 15 to 20 million. That's for sure reasonable. Over that, I don't know. I mean, it depends if you fly with a private jet or you come with a train. Uh, costs are a, a very large adjective, you know, it depends where you put it. So how would you describe now the business model of one wind farm, um, for example, or on the example or, or on your? What is the, uh, for example, the time um, that, that you see that you can break even in the project? Um, what is basically a business model, to cut the long story short? The business, the business story of a wind farm is pretty simple. Uh, the basics are simple. Uh, a wind farm consists of a number of machines, which are an object industrially produced somewhere. And you just install it where it's more windy and where the sites are more suitable. And we all understood that. How we make money out of, out of a wind turbine, it's as well pretty simple. The wind turbine is a machine which is capable to convert into electricity the thrust of the wind. Quite easy. The electricity that we produce is injected into the grid and it is accordingly to the local tariff paid. There is a feed-in tariff which is a very important part of the investment at the beginning because it guarantees a return on the investment on a certain amount of time but it doesn't give you the certainty that you will be paid back. It's, a, let's say, a help which comes from the government. And all the rest is, uh, is like a normal company. I mean, you have an accountant, you have engineers, and you have to look at the facility in order to have it working and uh, operate it and maintain it properly and according to the laws of the, of the country hosting the facility. In this case, well, according to the laws of Serbia. Okay, but how important the subsidiaries are? I mean, is this business uh, possible without <coughs> subsidiaries or any kind of uh, stimulation coming from the state? It depends very much by the country and it depends very much uh, on how the country is market-oriented or not market-oriented. I'm giving you a very very brief example. Uh, the average price of electricity in some nearby, co nearby countries is about 80 euros per megawatt hour. The Serbian feed-in tariff, so the all-in price for electricity produced in wind in Serbia is about 92 euros per megawatt hour. So there is no big gap. But your question makes sense if we were operating in a free market regime in Serbia. In Serbia, unfortunately, or so far, let's say, uh, we have regulated price for electricity, meaning that the price of electricity doesn't match the real cost of production plus a reasonable margin. So, to the to the people on the street, it may look that our feed-in tariff is an exaggeration and it's a big favor that we, ha we receive. But indeed, we have to consider a wider, uh, wider uh, let's say, uh, field of analysis. Um, speaking of which, how happy are you with regulations for, for, for production of electricity from the uh, wind energy? Now, all the, the last papers, the last regulations passed the public debate and they should be before the government soon. How happy are you with the regulations? Well, <laughs> I'm not that much happy, um, but I, I noticed that there is an improvement. So if we want to take the good news out of the news, we'll say, I'm happy because I see some improvement and finally we see that the government is committed to make it happen. There are some things which really don't make sense. For example, the limiting of the production of a wind farm to 3,000 hours. That's a limit which is badly influencing the capability of uh, reducing the global warming and to, you know, and to have a positive fallout on the Serbian community. If it works, if it, if it is good, like it is, why to limit? So we, we, we really don't like this thing, but I hope that during the public debate and uh, the next steps this thing will be fixed or adjusted according to governmental needs. Uh, but were you as an investor or uh, let's say the investors in a pos position to influence on, on, on regulations? Uh, basically we have a very limited capability of influencing. I mean we just can at the end of the story decide where to do it or not to do it. And this is the way how we are 
understanding the legal frame which is given to us. I mean, we decide to invest in countries which want wind energy. If the country decides that wind energy is something they don't want, we cannot force the, the sovereign country to accept our investments. Secondly, I would notice that there are countries where, on the opposite, you are not allowed to build wind energy unless you cannot guarantee a production of a certain amount of hours. So it's exactly the opposite. Instead of saying you cannot produce more than 3,000 hours per year, they tell you, okay, you can build it, but if you produce less than 2,000 hours per year, you will pay a penalty for the grid. Because we, as a grid, are giving you the facility, the connection, the support, and you are not injecting nothing in the system. So this thing, I, I really hope, will be fixed very soon. And then will be a game changer for the, the industry in the country. Um, the, um, the, um, how should I put it? Um, the thing between uh, investors and, and the state in this business is um, kind of a strange. I know that investors are not very happy with the regulations and with all the administration. On the other hand, people from the government would say that the investors came armed with what they've already experienced in other countries and that Serbia is uh, in an unfortunate position to uh, fulfill most of the wishes from the investors that of course want to be sure that their investment will be uh, break even and the money will be earned. Um, did the investors ask for too much in Serbia or it's just a subjective feeling of the people from, from the government? Uh, each one of the parties here has its own truth. Okay, So if you listen to the government, they have their truth. If you listen to those who made too much noise about wind energy, they have their reason. Uh, our position is uh, we want to swap the truth with the facts, with the evidence. Where is the evidence here? The evidence is, one, it is possible to make wind energy in Serbia. And we, we are the living proof about this. Two, you must be pretty much flexible when you are approaching a new sector in a new country and you cannot just import your standards in the new country because it, will, it won't work. Third, uh, the, it was artificially or not artificially, I don't know, but it was created a bad atmosphere around wind energy in this country. And the government and the various government would change it over time where more or less badly influenced by this cloud of, uh, of negative information. I don't know the reason, but there are other sources of energy which are strongly incentivated in Serbia, which, with, which uh, benefit from much higher feed-in tariff than wind, for example solar, biomass, biogases, which are three times higher, four times higher, but nobody is complaining. There are some open points. But if we stay on the facts, on the, on the evidence, wind energy is absolutely positive on the long term because it guarantees Serbia independence from the energy point of view, from import uh, oil and other sources from other countries. It generates a significant step ahead into the uh, technology of the country. It generates new jobs. It generates new knowledge about new technologies. And it has a positive fallout in terms of taxation because we pay taxes on revenue, on property, local taxes and central taxes. It has good effects on the local communities. The places where we install windmills become a touristic attraction for school and for scientific tourists. And uh, there are positive outcomes in terms of more people going to restaurants, more people visiting, in our case, Kula and then Rishats and so on and so on. So, if we stay on the evidence and we leave the gossip out, there are very positive things. The mission of every niche government, which I've been uh, working with in cooperation, is to ensure a prospective, uh, uh, let's say long-term, positive environment for the country. And if we don't look at the numbers in the first years when we have to pay back the investment, the asset will remain in the country, will work for the country independence and will be uh, a weapon that the government has 
to prove that the things are moving on in the country. And I think this is absolutely positive new and news and uh, it's not easy to back talk about this, you know. Okay, now uh, I want to ask a few questions. What do you think that will be benefits for the local community? As I mentioned before, there are many benefits, starting from, for example, the construction. Okay? We employed more than 50, 60 people during the construction, which have been uh, relentlessly working all of the summer on the site. All of them are not Serbs, but they are from Vojvodina, so they are all from there. They gain new experience in a new thing, and uh, we are going to capitalize this experience for future investments. So a lot of local companies were engaged, all of them worked, they were paid in a satisfactory way, uh, landowners were paid well, all of those wi which were directly or indirectly involved in the surrounding of the plan received uh, some kind of compensation, for example right to passage, right of uh, cable, right of blah blah blah. Plus once the facility is built we have uh, operating and maintenance which is done locally so we have a certain number of employees and indirect uh, positive effects like I mentioned before tourism, uh, local taxes and, uh, and so on. So I think, I think the, the, uh, if we do the aftermath it's absolutely in our favor. Uh, now um, what was your model? Did you uh, buy land from the people for, for, for the windmills or it was rented for a certain amount of time. What is the deal? We have, uh, as you know, we have several projects going on in the country and uh, each project is uh, different from the other. I mean, we tend to follow what is the desire of the landowner. In case the landowner would like to sell, we we'll buy and we give back the land to the landowner for cultivation because we occupy a very limited space and the land plots in Serbia are designed in a certain way Whereas uh, usually we need to buy or to rent few hectares where we use a few square meters. So we don't know what to do with this land and we found proper to give back the land to the real owners and say okay you are free to cultivate that. We just need a small portion. In some other cases we rented the land and we guaranteed a revenue like an additional pension for the landowners. And so it, there is no generic rule. I mean, in the Kula case, uh, we bought the land. And how many people will work, will be employed in the, in the one that is going to start on November the 12th? So, as, as I said before, we have to de de define two stages. In the first stage, where you're building, I told you the number is between 50 and 70, uh, which were involved. Then you have to count also the indirect jobs. I mean, iron and uh, all of this concrete and the materials which come from Serbia, they generate indirect jobs which have to be put into the mat. Uh, once the facility is up and running, according to the Serbian law, you have to have at least a number of uh, five to seven people per each facility, which have to have a specific license and they have to have uh, a specific uh, qualification in order to operate safely the facility. So we're going to respect this. Moreover, on top we have uh, an office here in Belgrade where we have people, we have engineers and uh, we will keep all of these people and actually we are thinking to increase our structure. But if we, if we look at the, at the investment itself, we should look at how many people we have employed so far in the last eight years and how many people work with us, starting from the university, uh, Nikola Tesla Institute, Yusna Baska and all other suppliers, uh, Machino Project and all of them which have been in a way involved in these in this, uh, actions that we are taking over. So we really have to look at the numbers how they are and to look at the evidence more than the gossip. I think it's, uh, it brings us in a, in a better light. In, in a better. And the, uh, what is Yuzhna Bachka doing in the, in the project? The, the project is it's, it's really complicated. I mean, I'm not going to uh, annoy you with the yeah, technical details, but, but b basically we can't do the development by ourselves with our engineers. We need to have uh, companies which have the license, the stamps and the permissions to design such a kind uh, of object. For example, uh, object taller than 50 meters in Serbia undergo specific legislation than other kind of objects. So we had to involve all of these pre-existing companies and ask and, ask and, uh, and uh, obtain their support in order to achieve the building permit. So basically your company was not bothering pretty much with all the 
uh, with all the papers or did because um, in Romania the model is mostly that a certain local company finishes all the paperwork, finish negotiations with the landowner, blah, blah, blah. And then with that uh, shovel-ready project, it goes before the big companies they want to invest. The Romanian model is pretty much speculative. Whereas you have uh, locals collecting few papers, starting a project and selling to some other investors. In, in Serbia, this is simply impossible. You start the project, you finish the project. You have a relationship between you and the government, specifically in the name of the company which develops the project. You cannot sell a building permit in Serbia, you can sell an object. So this is the most remarkable and positive thing about the Serbian development environment. And I think Serbia should teach this to other countries around. Uh, the results of the development based on a speculation approach is uh, a catastrophe. As you saw that in Romania, they, they sold the same paper 50 times, investors came in and out. Uh, it created uncertainty on the system and on the investor side. So I, I would say that Serbia started uh, late, but the way we started here is a way which is a sustainable. Um, and now at the end, um, so you were steady and firm, you went through with all the challenging uh, and it lasted for so many years. So now you are finally at the end of your, of, of your first project. But uh, what, is the, what are the plans for, for example, next five or ten years? How many projects do you have? And at the end, uh, how many power do you have in all those projects and how many of those projects do you see as the ones that are... Ten years is a long run, first of all. And uh, we hope we will sit here in, in the next ten years and I'm going to inform you how much we have built in, in, in the meantime. Uh, seriously, the, uh, we have a pipeline of projects which is ambitious. If we grab the support and if we keep on working like we're doing now, we think it's pretty much feasible and it will be feasible not in 10 years, but in three, four years. Beside wind energy, we are investing also in other sources of energy and uh, we are bringing in our experience we have in Italy and in other countries uh, where we just don't produce energy, but also we trade energy, we deliver energy to the families and we invoice energy. So we are in a way, a green alternative to carbon-oriented operators. And uh, this is where we give our contribution. So that that's could be, let's say, a nice selling story over the next 10 years. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank it you. It was really a pleasure speaking with you. Because I must say,